Welcome back to Sleep Tight Moon for another story from Nordic Folk Tales. Grab a blanket and get comfortable. Tonight's story is called Toller's Neighbors. Once upon a time, a young man and a young girl were in service together at a mansion down near Claude Mill in the district of Lysgard. They became attached to each other, and as they both were honest and faithful servants, their master and mistress had a great regard for them and gave them a wedding dinner the day they were married. Their master gave them also a little cottage with a little field, and there they went to live. This cottage lay in the middle of a wild heath, and the surrounding country was in bad dispute, for in the neighborhood were a number of old grave mounds which it was said were inhabited by the mount folk, though Toller, so the peasant was called, cared little for that. They had now taken possession of their cottage and moved in all their little property. When the man and his wife, late one evening, were sitting talking together as to how they could best manage to get on in the world, they heard a knock at the door, and on Toller opening it, in walked a little man and wished them good evening. He had a red cap on his head, a long beard and long hair, a large hump on his back, and a leather apron before him, in which was stuck a hammer. They immediately knew him to be a troll. Notwithstanding, he looked so good-natured and friendly that they were not at all afraid of him. "'Now here, Toller,' said the little stranger, I see well enough that you know who I am, and matter stands thus. I am a poor little hillman to whom people have left no other habitation on earth than the graves of fallen warriors or mounds where the rays of the sun never can shine down upon us. We have heard that you are come to live here, and our king is fearful that you will do us harm, and even destroy us. He has, therefore, sent me up to you this evening that I should beg of you, as amicably as I could, to allow us to hold our dwellings in peace. You shall never be annoyed by us or disturbed by us in your pursuits." "'Be quite at your ease, good man,' said Toller. "'I have never injured any of God's creatures willingly, "'and the world is large enough for us all. "'I believe, and I think we can manage to agree "'without the one having any need to do mischief to the other.' "'Well, thank God,' exclaimed the little man, "'beginning in his joy to dance about the room. "'That is excellent, and we will in return "'do you all the good in our power, "'and that you will soon discover, but now I must depart.' "'Will you not first take a spoonful of supper with us?' asked the wife, setting a dish of porridge down on the stool near the window, for the man of the mount was so little that he could not reach up to the table. "'No, I thank you,' said the mannequin. "'Our king is impatient for my return, and it would be a pity to let him wait for the good news I have to tell him.' Hereupon the little man bade them farewell and went his way. From that day forwards, Toller lived in peace and concord with the little people of the mount. They could see them go in and out of their mounds in daylight, and no one ever did anything to vex them. At length they became so familiar that they went in and out of Toller's house, just as if it had been their own. Sometimes it happened that they would borrow a pot or a copper kettle from the kitchen, but always brought it back again, and set it carefully on the same spot which they had taken it. They also did all the service they could in return. When the spring came, they would come out of their mounds in the night, gathering all the stones off the arable land, and lay them in a heap along the furrows. At harvest time, they would pick up all the ears of corn that nothing might be lost to Toller. All this was observed by the farmer, who, when in bed or when he read his evening prayer, often thanked the Almighty for having given him the mountain folk for neighbors. At Easter and Whitsuntide, or in the Christmas holidays, he always set a dish of nice milk porridge for them, as good as it could be made out on the mound. Once, after having given birth to a daughter, his wife was so ill that Toller thought she was near her end. He consulted all the cunning people in the district, but no one knew what to prescribe for her recovery. He sat up every night and watched over the sufferer that he might be at hand to administer her wants. Once he fell asleep, and on opening his eyes again towards the morning, he saw the room full of the mount folk. One sat and rocked the baby, another was busy in cleaning the room, a third stood by the pillow of the sick woman and made a drink of some herbs, which he gave his wife. As soon as they observed that Toller was awake, they all ran out of the room, but from that night the poor woman began to mend, and before a fortnight was passed she was able to leave her bed and go about her household work, well and cheerful as before. Another time Toller was in trouble for want of money to get his horses shod before he went to the town. He talked the matter over with his wife, and they knew not well what course to adopt. But when they were in bed, his wife said, "'Art thou asleep, Toller?' No, he answered, what is it? I think, said she, there is something the matter with the horses in the stable. They are making such a disturbance. Toller rose, lighted his lantern, and went to the stable, and, on opening the door, found it full of the little mount folk. They had made the horses lie down, because the mannequins could not reach up to them. Some were employed in taking off the old shoes, some were filling the heads of the nails, while others were tacking on the new shoes, and the next morning, when Toller took his horses to water, he found them shod so beautifully that the best of smiths could not have shod them better. In this manner, the Mount Folk and Toller rendered all the good services they could to each other, and many years passed pleasantly. Toller began to grow an old man. His daughter was grown up, and his circumstances were better every year. Instead of the little cottage in which he began the world, he now owned a large and handsome house, and the naked wild heath was converted into fruitful, arable land. One evening, just before bedtime, someone knocked at the door, and the man of the Mount walked in. 
Toller and his wife looked at him with surprise, for the mannequin was not in his usual dress. He wore on his head a shaggy cap, a woolen kerchief around his throat, and a great sheepskin cloak covered his body. In his hand he had a stick, and his countenance was very sorrowful. He brought a greeting to Toller from the king, who requested that he, his wife, and little Inger would come over to them in the mount that evening, for the king had a matter of importance about which he wished to talk with him. The tears ran down the little man's cheeks while he said this, and when Toller tried to comfort him and inquired into the source of his trouble, the man of the mount only wept the more, but would not impart the cause of his grief. Toller, his wife and daughter, then went over to the mount. On descending into the cave, they found it decorated with bunches of sweet willow, crowfoots, and other flowers that were to be found on the heath. A large table was spread from one end of the cave to the other. When the peasant and his family entered, they were placed at the head of the table by the side of the king. The little folk also took their places and began to eat, but they were far from being as cheerful as usual. They sat inside and hung down their heads, and it was easy to see that something had gone amiss with them. When the repast was finished, the king said to Toller, I invited you to come over to us because we all wish to thank you for having been so kind and friendly to us during the whole time we have been neighbors. But now there are so many churches built in the land, and all of them have such great bells which ring so loud morning and evening that we can bear it no longer. We are, therefore, going to leave Jutland and pass over to Norway, as the greater number of our people have done not long ago. We now wish you farewell, Toller, as we must part. When the king had said this, all the mount folk came and took Toller by the hand and bade him farewell, and the same to his wife. When they came to Inger, they said, To you, dear Inger, we will give a remembrance of us, that you may think of the little mount people when they are far away. And as they said this, each took up a stone from the ground and threw it into Inger's apron. They left the mount one by one with the king leading the way. Toller and his family remained standing on the mount as long as they could discern them. They saw the little trolls wandering over the heath, each with a wallet on his back and a stick in his hand. When they had gone a good part of the way to where the roads lead down to the sea, they all turned around once more and waved their hands to say farewell. Then they disappeared, and Toller saw them no more. Sorrowfully, he returned to his home. The next morning, Inger saw that all the small stones the Mount Folk had thrown into her apron shone and sparkled and were real precious stones. Some were blue, others brown, white, and black, and it was the trolls who had imparted the color of their eyes into the stones. And all the precious stones which we now see shine and sparkle only because of the Mount Folk have given them the color of their eyes, and it was some of these beautiful precious stones which they once gave to Inger. That's all for tonight. Sweet dreams.